Let us pray together. Lord, we thank you for the promise that you make. That when we gather together in your name, you are here. And so we ask that you would open up our hearts and our minds to your presence. That you would work in us that which you desire. That you would form the very body of Christ in our midst. And so we say, speak, Lord, for your servants are listening. We yield to your authority. And we thank you that we are yours. For it is in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, that we pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. <laughs> so I have a question to ask. How many of you don't normally come to Holy Presence on a Sunday morning? Yeah, quite a few. Welcome. Really, really glad. This is almost like a diocesan event. And that, I, I think that's really exciting. But what that means is, is that there may be things that happen in the service that don't go the way they happen in your church. And I want you, I hope that's okay with you. Um, it, is, it is possible, you see, to get so caught up in a particular tradition, a good tradition. But if we don't do it the way that you're used to, you keep going back to, oh, now wait a second. That didn't happen the way it was supposed to. Meaning the way it was supposed to was the way it happened in your church. Um, I say that because you see that's exactly what's going on, only in a much, in a much weightier manner with the gospel story. You see, Peter, the disciples, all of the followers of Jesus, at the time that Jesus gives us this taking up your cross, really believed with all their heart this thing. We were chosen by God as Israelis to be a light to the nations. How we function as a light to the nations is by our obedience to the law, the law that God gave us. And by virtue of being obedient to the law, we will witness to the rest of the nations what God expects of people. And not only that, as we are obedient, number three, we will prosper. God will bless us. And if you read the content of the Old Testament, prosperity, God blessing us, has to do with material possessions, lots of children, being respected, being given wisdom. In other words, it has very, very much kind of day-to-day -day currency. And that's what it meant, in fact, to be a good Jew. And the very fact that you see if you had many children and you were prosperous and you were wise, those were all the signs, oh, God is blessing you. Jesus says, no. No. And it was so shocking to Peter that he literally rebuked Jesus in public. Because you see, Jesus says something absolutely different from that. He said, here he is, son of man, God in the flesh. And what is going to happen? Look at your gospel reading. Then Jesus began to teach them that the son of man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. And he said all this part of it. Where is prosperity in that equation? Where is God blessing you with material abundance? And many children. Jesus wasn't even married. In other words, what Jesus was saying, that God's appointed course for his singularly blessed and anointed son was this path. And Peter said, I've always thought that path was a sign of God cursing you. Even down to crucifixion. And so, of course, it, he can't stand it. it. It's like his whole brain has gone, no, that's not what I've ever been taught in my whole life. He must be wrong. He must be wrong. And so, Jesus... Peter openly rebukes him, 
Pope takes him aside, rebukes him, and what does Jesus do? Turning and looking at his disciples as if, do you see what I'm going to do here? This is really important. He says, addressing Peter, get behind me, Satan. It's the only time this happens in the entire Bible. For you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. Wow. In other words, what you believe is not my path. It is not what God has asked of me. And then he will go on to say, very clearly, that's not what is going to happen to you either. In other words, the promise of the for the followers of Jesus is not if you obey and do the things that you're asked to do, then what's going to happen is that God is going to bless you materially. He's going to give you many children. You are going to become wise, and you're going to be well thought of in your community. I say it that plainly because there are a lot of Christian teachers out there that teach just that. If you do what God asks of you, all the blessings of Abraham are yours. How many of you have heard that? Oh, it's twisted. It's not what Jesus is saying here at all. In fact, he is saying something quite different. He says, and I want to talk about a little of what it means. He calls the crowd with his disciples. In other words, he wants to make sure he is in the hearing of everyone. That's how premierly important this is. If any want to be become my followers, it's a very different path. Let them deny themselves. See, prosperity says all of your wants are satisfied. The way of Jesus says no. That's not the way of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. Let them deny themselves and take up their cross. Meaning, being willing even to die should it be asked of you. Martyrdom. Literal martyrdom. That's what Jesus is talking about here. In other words, please do not get the idea, what is my cross to bear? My cross to bear is my mother-in-law who drives me crazy. <laughs> my cross to bear is my disobedient children who never do what I say. My cross to bear, I mean, you can make this list. Uh-uh. That's self-centered and absolutely contrary to the will of God. That is not what this means. Taking up a cross beam and going to Golgotha is an invitation to martyrdom. In other words, I'm willing to die. It is, in fact, the outworking, the fruition of what a life of self-denial looks like. In other words, to be, to be killed as a martyr is absolutely consonant with a commitment to self-denial. It is not a surprise ending it is, in fact, and the early church saw it this way, as the actual outworking of a self-denial life. In fact, there was a whole stream in the life of the early church that actually considered martyrdom a privilege, that they would actually openly pursue, to the rebuke now, however, of the rest of the church, but they would. Entirely different from the way we think of it, you see. But I want to make sure we understand what Jesus is saying and how his people would hear it. How his people would hear it is a commitment, if necessary, to martyrdom. So how does, this, how does this play out for you and me? First of all, and this is actually being played out in what we're going to do in terms of baptism and confirmation, in terms of baptismal questions and commitments, you're, at, you're making a commitment to order your life under a whole different set of priorities and precepts. And you know on the front end that what is not being promised to you is what we sort of euphemistically call the good life. Any more than it would have meant to be true for the old covenant, if I, be, if I obey, God blesses me and I get all I need. And maybe a little bit of what I want to. No, instead, you're committing your life to two things. Number one, you're committing your life to identification. Identification with Jesus. And identification with Jesus' mission. 
That's the heartbeat of what it means to be a follower, hear the word? A, a follower of Jesus Christ. I want my life to look like His. I want Him to lead and guide. I want to come under His authority so that His priorities are my priorities. And if my priorities don't match His priorities, guess who does the self-denying? Not God. I'm the one that says no to my priorities when they come in contact, when it comes in conflict with His. And it has very, very, very practical circumstances. It has to do with how you spend your time. It has to do with the caliber of your, of your relationships. How you think about moral and ethical questions, what you do with your money, how you think about your future. Everything is all underneath the commitment of, God, I want to do what you ask of me, and I need you to show me what that is. Because, you see, left to my own devices, I will, pay, I will choose the more self-centered task every single time. It's just what it means to be human. And therefore, I understand that there is a role in self-denial because what your, com your commitment is not to my self-satisfaction. Otherwise, he'd never say deny yourself, right? His commitment instead is to shape us in such a way that our life looks more and more like the life of Jesus. There is a clear, <coughs> visible parallel between the life of Jesus and the life that he is working in us. <clears throat> now that's huge, isn't it? That's a tall, very, very tall order. And it is not easy. Um, I was at a seminar yesterday, along with my canon to the ordinary, we were there Friday and Saturday, <coughs> up at the Shota House in Wisconsin. Yeah, it was minus seven degrees. Um, and it was on church conflict. Like, we don't experience church, con church conflict here. And it was, it was superb. It was literally one of the best things that I've been a part of. And he talked in very personal terms about how he had to wrestle with the issue of choosing, in essence, Jesus' way, denying himself and what he would prefer to do. And he told a story. He is a Presbyterian minister, and he's a consultant in churches, four churches in conflict, which is why I was hired. He said, um, I was invited one time to be an interim pastor, and it was a large church. Lots of people, lots of responsibilities, and a lot of money. And I was only the interim. I was just, in essence, supposed to keep the ship going until they called somebody new. The last week of my interim period, I discovered that something horribly and criminally erroneous had happened with money. It really was insurance fraud. Someone bent the rules and lied to the insurance company so that somebody on their staff could get insurance that in fact did not qualify for it. He understood that even though they might have done it for all the best reasons, it was in fact an illegal thing to do. And it was now brought to his attention. He said, what did I want to do? I wanted to kick it down to the next rector. <laughs> After all, it was my last week. And the people who were involved in it were very prominent and important people. People who had signed off on this were public leaders in the life of that church. In our tradition, it would have been the senior warden. Everything inside of me wanted to not say something. And worse, he said, how I found out about it was that somebody came and told me and did not want me to tell anyone else. He finally went back to the person and says, I cannot not report this. She was furious. And he said, this is illegal. I must say something. So at their next elders, what we would call a vestry, in his report, he reported it. And of course, they asked, how did you find out about this? And he said, I heard it through Marie. So she was publicly exposed for doing that. 
But it was the right thing to see for her to do. But she was also facing really being just vilified for being the one who sort of sprang the secret. It, it sent shockwaves through the leadership. But he couldn't not do it, you see. Because to do otherwise would have actually come into compliance with an illegal act. Everything inside of him, you see, wanted to protect himself. Self-protection can be the opposite of self-denial. It was here. Or it comes down to you hearing something and you've got this tight place inside of you. You know what that looks like, don't you? It's anger, it's resentment, it doesn't want to go away. And you keep acting like it's not there and so you make it sort of, you push it down and if you don't think about it, it actually doesn't typically come to the surface until something happens and a trigger takes place. Well, look at it this way. If you went to a dentist and you had a filling in your tooth and you just, the dentist discovered that there was actually some decay underneath the filling. And the dentist said to you, oh, don't worry about it. I'll just take out the old filling and put the new one. You would go, what kind of dentist is that? It's going to destroy the tooth. If the decay isn't removed, it's going to destroy the tooth. Now, is that a painful operation? Anybody's had that happen? We'll go, yes, it is. It is a painful operation. But if you want to save, if you want to save the tooth and, you, and the rest of them, you've got to get it done. It's like that. So God will, you see, come and say, in the midst of your prayers, oh, but what, what about this? And you can act like it's not there. You can even lie to God and say, well, I'm really over it. But the very fact that the fist is still present in you indicates that you're actually not over it. And the grace of God has to work more deeply in your life. You will want to preserve yourself, you see, in the midst of all of that. But that's precisely the opposite of what Jesus is asking. You see, it gets down into the smallest but the most substantive things to be willing to identify with the mission and ministry of Jesus. And sometimes one pays a high price. But you understand that's what you've signed up for. That's what it actually means to be a follower of Jesus. And it's not just a little private thing that doesn't have any impact on your public life. Notice that the example I told the first was a very public thing. Taking up your cross in that culture was a very public thing. You literally, it was strapped on your back and you walked through the center of the city of Jerusalem to Golgotha. Everybody knew that you were going to die. So it is with that making that commitment to Jesus. The reason we do baptism and confirmation within the context of a public setting is that it is a public commitment. And the Christian faith is meant to be lived out in a very clear and public way. I read this week uh, about a woman who actually is a blogger for The Guardian, which is a uh, newspaper in London. She also is a correspondent with Gentleman's Quarterly, GQ, a men's magazine, and she's recently become a Christian. And she wrote a blog entry about what it meant for her to be a Christian. And she said, you know what the hardest part was? Dealing with other people's reactions. She said, I'm sitting in the green room about to go on a television show, and they're getting me ready. And the faith question comes up. She says, because it does. I don't always do it, but it does. And therefore, in that moment, I have to face up and say something, or not. What am I going to do, she said. And believe me, when it comes out that I've made this Christian commitment, it's like somebody broke wind. <laughs> Everybody gets embarrassed, they're quiet, they, don't, they kind of shuffle and look at their toes, and they don't know how to act at that moment. It's very, very odd for them, for anyone in their circle. Listen to where we're talking, you see, we're talking about a man's fashion magazine. I, you know, a, a, a large newspaper in, the, in England, it's not the place where you would find strongly committed believers in Jesus Christ. And she said, but, but, I have to be true 
to the one to whom I'm committed. So it's a public thing. Because Jesus bore the cross publicly. Otherwise, what happens is, here's the thing you set up for yourself. And I'm done. When you make the decision to keep your Christian life private, when you make the decision to not ask the hard questions, or to duck them when they are asked of you about the implications of your faith, what you're doing, just like the resentment is that you're pushing it down, that actually leaves a hollow space in you. A space that was actually meant to be filled by the wondrous, powerful, gracious Holy Spirit of God. Empowering you to do this, you see. But you're saying, no, no, I'm going to keep, this, keep it all down here. And so what you're left with is emptiness. He who would save his life will lose it. And the word, the loser, the phrase that Jesus uses, is actually a euphemism in Hebrew for frittering, frittering your life away with needless pursuits. Meaning, you're going to need something to occupy your time. And what is that going to be? Oh, it could be anything from the novel that you're reading, it could be for the pursuit that you're making around financial gain, it could be all kinds of things. But in the face of choosing to follow Jesus, as in comparison, it's just a needless pursuit. It's the, the quote from the book of Ecclesiastes, I've tasted everything that there is in the world, the ruler says, and I've discovered it's all just vanity. So it's not that you're not going to do something. The question is, what are you going to do? He who would save his life, keep all this protected, Try to have everything that the world offers and be a Christian at the same time. Make sure everybody likes you. Make sure that when something comfortable happens, you don't mention it. We even use that almost, you know, it's really not Christian to say some of the things that you see. We even try to protect through religion this whole call of what it means to be clear in public and to be committed to self-denial. We relegate self-denial to giving up chocolate and Lent or something like that. It's not what we're talking about here. And as a result, we're hungry. We want to fill our life. We need purpose. So we do all kinds of things. The world is constantly filled with invitations to spend some way, spend our time and our money some way. And there, believe me, that Satan is more than willing to fill our life with all kinds of pursuits that protect us from the implications of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. But in the end, he who would save his life will lose it. But he who is willing to lose his life, in other words, intentionally when the time comes to take, make the harder decision, to be exposed occasionally, if necessary, to ridicule, to live at a sacrificial level that I don't see being lived out by other Christians. So why, God, are you asking that of me? Those kinds of things. That would be a great person whose life is filled with the empowering Spirit of God and knows and has a wondrous sense of purpose. Why am I here? I am here to do the will of God, and by God I will do it. That would be the person who saves his life. So Lent is in fact a season that asks us to take stock. Where are we hedging our bets? And where are we going full throttle? For God and not for ourselves. And it has everything to do, as we said at the beginning, with how we deal with other people, the way we spend our time, the way we spend our money, the practical, very ordinary things of life. And out of that, can come something gracious, wonderful, and really quite beautiful. A sacrificial life that rings with the joy of the Lord. A laying down of one's life that is filled with the poise and the grace of someone who has yielded his or her life to the presence of the Holy Spirit. To have a deep sense of purpose and abiding confidence 
that I am not an accident, and I am not here by accident, but I am here to do the will of, to, of him who sent me. Do I always get it right? Oh, no. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But the good news is, is that he is, as we prayed at the beginning, so gracious. He wants us to get up, put the cross back on our back, and keep going, because eternity is at stake. And he literally fights on our behalf. He will not fight on behalf of the self-centered person unless it's to spoil your self-centered ways. Sometimes difficulty happens because God's trying to get your attention. <coughs> but he fights powerfully on behalf of those who are finding ways before God to lay down their lives. And that's what baptism and confirmation and reception really mean. I am in this way, before you, my sisters and brothers, choose to ask God to help me to lay down my life. So, with that, we are going to move into baptism and confirmation. Before we do, let's pray together. Gracious Lord, we thank you that you love us enough to root out the deep places that are full of decay, to invite us into a life not marked by frivolous pursuits, but marked by purpose and meaning that actually changes the lives of other people for your glory. So Lord, we yield to you and we thank you for your gracious patience. Lord, we do confess to you that we often fall back and protect ourselves rather than yield. That we desire that prosperity and that comfort in a way that often sacrifices your purposes for us. But we thank you that you are generous and that you are kind. And that you are also relentlessly committed to seeing Christ formed in us. And so we say to you, oh Lord, even though it's a hard thing to pray, Continue to work in us that which you desire. For it is in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, that we pray. Amen. Amen.